Mark alluded to something there at the end of his talk about uh, private money. Sounds a little strange almost, you know, gov- money not supplied by government. But that's actually something I'd like all of you to consider this morning. Uh, the, the topic I'm going to present today is a free market in money, with, with a question mark at the end, because it, it sounds strange, doesn't it? It's, it sounds more like a question than a declarative statement. We don't think about money the same way we think about it, other commodities, right? We, uh, why, why is that? We tend to assume, of course, it has to be supplied by government. Uh, we, want, we all want more of it, but we don't think too much about its quality. We don't think too much about its origins. We don't really think too much about why or how it came to have value at all. In other words, you have one of these, right? This is a one. I borrowed this. Um, but why does this have value? Why can you take this to McDonald's and maybe, I don't know, can you get a small Diet Coke? Um, why does it have any value at all? Well, mostly because the government says it does. And we just go along with it. Now, of course, lots of other goods and services are supplied by the market. But why not money? Why not the medium of exchange that we use to obtain these other goods and services? And maybe a a broader question is, why do so many otherwise free market advocates believe we need monetary policy, that we need the government to have a policy for money? I mean, most people don't really spend their day thinking, well, we need a a housing policy or an energy policy or or an automobile policy. Most of you probably came here today in an automobile. I mean, there are laws and rules and regulations, but none of us really wake up thinking, gosh, the government ought to have an overarching automobile policy. So these are just some of the ideas I'd like you to consider today, perhaps change the way you think about or view money. So to start, why don't we think about something where there there is a free market, the aforementioned automobile. Just take a simple Honda Accord. Now really, an Accord represents a, a miraculous coordination of individuals. Tens of thousands of people around the world came together, most of them complete strangers to produce the Honda Accord that's sitting on the lot here at Honda of Auburn. It's actually a miracle if you think about it. But it it mostly came about in free market ways, right? There's capital was supplied. Honda's a gigantic multinational public company. You can go buy a share of stock in Honda, so you can give them some money, so they have some capital, and you'll, you'll be an owner. For, I think, about 48 bucks, you can be an owner of Honda Motors Company Limited, big Japanese company. So... They design these cars mostly in Japan, Japanese engineers. Uh, Parts come from all around the world. They're assembled, various locations. A lot of Accords are made in the US, but some are made in Japan, Belgium, Canada, et cetera. They're shipped, of course, on huge cargo container ships around the world. They're sold worldwide. Honda Accords, ubiquitous worldwide. Now, they're not sold in a completely free market with no government involvement whatsoever. Of course, every jurisdiction that, an accord that involves a Honda Accord, the making of one, has taxes and labor laws and environmental laws and, and regulations. And, uh, inv- <clears throat> you know, there's import tariffs when, when, a, country, when a Honda enters a country from, from another country, etc. But we generally think of, a, of an automobile as being the product of a free market, right? I mean, Honda has to compete against other brands. You could buy a Toyota if you wanted to. Uh, Honda is, again, privately capitalized. And each year, each, each year it, it incurs loss or profit based on its worldwide operations. In theory, at least, Honda could go out of business and declare bankruptcy. After the, the crisis of 2008, we saw our own government prop up some U.S. auto manufacturers. But in theory, of course, Honda could go out of business and cease to exist. Um, there's no central government in Japan or the U.S. or otherwise that, that sits around with a planning committee that decides, well, how many Honda Accords should be built in 2015, and what should, the, what should the MSRP of a Honda Accord be, and how much should the workers in the factory get paid, and where should these cars be sold, how many should be sent to the U.S.? You know, there's no central planning committee. We leave that to Honda, to the smart people at Honda. So therefore, I think it's okay to think of a Honda Accord as basically a product of a relatively free market. And so when you, when you imagine all the human coordination, human effort that goes into bringing that, that humble Honda Accord to your driveway, you know, is it really unthinkable 
that the marketplace could also supply the money that you use to buy on Accord? Well, let's think about that. You know, we think a lot about the quality of a Honda Accord, right? We think about the quality of any good or service we're going to buy before we buy it. But what about the quality of the money we exchange for it? In other words, that's half the transaction, right? You give money, they give you a Honda Accord. So when you're thinking about buying an Accord, you or your family, you, you might do a lot of internet research. You might go test drive one. You might talk to your friends and family. Maybe you have some knowledge because you've owned Hondas in the past and you thought the quality was good. You might think about Honda's reputation. So a lot of goes into your, your search for a car and you decide that it's a quality item and you make a decision to, to exchange probably, depending on the model, probably about $29,000. So significant sum of money to go buy a, a brand new Accord today. But what about the quality of the money you exchange for it, right? I mean, there's, there are laws called U legal tender laws. So Honda, at least operating in the US, but both as a practical and legal matter, more or less has to accept US dollars for it. So what can Honda do to say, well, what about the quality of the money you're giving us for our quality product? I mean, what if they're worried that the Federal Reserve is gonna do things that make the dollars you're giving them worth less soon? You know, what if they're worried about just sort of the future of monetary policy, the co makeup of Congress or the new Fed chair, Janet Yellen? Uh, how does Honda protect itself against these uncertainties? Now, Honda can't shop around for a different form of payment from you, right? There's no competition. Honda's getting a dollar, 29,000 of them. So that's one thing they do is they price that uncertainty into the price of a car. I mean, some of that 29,000 you pay, they have to sort of hedge against the future. And, and of course, you know, the price goes up. And the first Accords were, came out in 1976. Now they were about the size, you know, from about here to here. Um, but they cost about $3,900. A little less than $4,000 in 1976. Now, even adjusted for inflation today, that's maybe $17,000. So it's apples and oranges. Today's Accord is a much bigger, nicer vehicle, lasts longer, et cetera. But, but so the price does go up, and that's one way that Honda protects itself against the diminishing, or what they see as the diminishing quality of the money. Um, they, can, they can always sell it for more, right? They could say, well, we don't know what the Fed's going to do. We're going to sell it for $35,000, not $29,000. But... but it, you know, you raise the price, the demand is going to go down. They're going to sell fewer of them. That's what we call a downward sloping demand curve, right? The price of anything goes up, the demand for it falls. So even though they're getting more per car, they might sell fewer and they might end up making less profit. And also the price might not, the price might be what we call fairly elastic, right? Where just a small increase in price may cause a drop in demand that's bigger. So they may not have that much choice to just say, well, instead of charging you 29000 for it, we're going to charge you 35000 so it seems that Honda's in a little bit of a bind, right? You can shop around, but they can't. So, you know, in reality, there really is no free market competition on the money side, that half of the transaction. You know, as I mentioned, there's legal tender laws, and they, which basically says U.S. coins and U.S. currency, Federal Reserve notes, what we call the dollar, are, are legal tender for debts in the U.S. and also for paying your taxes, now, like, like a lot of bad laws, uh, legal tender laws came out of wartime. They, they came out of the Civil War era. Now, during the Civil War, the federal government began issuing greenback notes, called. They're, they're U.S. government notes. And these were not redeemable in gold or silver. They were just a, a piece of paper. Um, so after the war is over, people still had these things, but they were worth much less. And they wanted to pay, they wanted to pay for things with them. And of course, Congress itself had a lot of debts it incurred during the Civil War, strapped for money. So instead of having to come up with gold or silver, they started issuing these notes that they could use to pay for <coughs> troops and supplies and, and all the things, all the costs that come along with the Civil War. So in the, in the late 1800s, the Supreme Court comes along. Some people were disgruntled because these notes they had were no longer worth their face value. The Supreme Court basically held that in a series of cases, the paper money even if it's not redeemable in gold or silver, you can't go exchange it with the government for gold or silver. It can be legal tender for payment. So 
you know, because of, of both the history of these laws, these legal tender laws, and also as a practical matter operating in the U.S. where the U.S. dollar is used, you know, Honda has to accept the dollar. You know, what's the other option? I, you, you know, in theory, barter that Mark alluded to, barter's allowed in the U.S. It's legal. Uh, but it's taxed. You know, in theory, you could go to your Honda dealer and try to come up with something and say, hey, local dealer, you know, I'll give you some, some services for your business or I'll give you uh, some, some product that I sell or whatever it might be in exchange for a Honda Accord. Seems tough, but it might work. It might work, but, but the, the Accord dealer is still supposed to pay tax on the value, the fair market value of what you give them, just the same as they have to pay tax when you give them that $29,000. So, so barter seems kind of archaic, and as Mark pointed out, it makes us poorer because you've got to have something that each side wants. Kind of tough. We need money. Now, this isn't just an abstraction, okay? This isn't just a practical matter. I mean, the federal government can really come and put you in jail if you try to compete with its dollar. Okay, there's a, a gentleman named Bernard von Nothaus. He created something called the Liberty Dollar. Liberty Dollar is basically a, a gold or silver coin, um, later copper as well. And he also issued some notes that came along with it. And uh, it didn't say U.S. government or anything like that on it, but it was, you know, it kind of looked like a, a, a tradable coin. And it did have the word dollar on it, which turned out to be his downfall. Uh, now, it's perfectly okay for any of us to go make numismatic coins, right? Commemorative coins out of gold or silver. We're allowed to do that. We're just not allowed to call them money and, and use them as money. Now, Mr. Von Nothausen, he never called them U.S. dollars, or he never even really called them coins. But he, again, he did call them dollars, and they did say on them, in God we trust. So while he never encouraged or, or, or advocated that these could be used as legal tender, he did say, hey, you know, you might be able to barter these because they had value. They were made of actual physical precious metals. And he created some associates and merchants who would accept this Liberty Dollar, um, and they got commissions, you know. So, so he, he was doing this out of both an interest in money, but also he had a self-interest in it. Well, Mr. Von Nothaus uh, received a visit from uh, federal government agents. And in, in March of 2011, he was uh, pronounced guilty in court of, quote, making, possessing, and selling his own currency. Now, that's basically a fancy word for counterfeiting. And the prosecutor, the Justice Department, called this a form of domestic terrorism. That he was trying to undermine the legitimate currency of the country. But what's so funny about this is, you know, his currency actually had value. And like that dollar bill, which just has value because the federal government says it does, his, his actually had gold or silver or copper. Um, federal government, fortunately, just this last December, sentenced him to about six months of house arrest. So it wasn't a terrible story where he had years and years in prison, and he's an older gentleman. Uh, but they did seize $7 million worth of numismatic value in coins from him. No joke, $7 million bucks. And I know what you're, some of you are thinking, you know, why doesn't the government go after Bitcoin, right? They're basically saying this is currency. Why don't they go after him like Mr. Ronan asked? Well, they might. But for the moment, they've decided, and the, the uh, IRS has actually said that Bitcoin represents a, a capital asset, and that you just trade it like you have a value in it, and you just trade it like you would a share of Apple stock, so you have gain or loss when you get rid of Bitcoin. In other words, it's like an investment. So for the moment, it appears the federal government's not going after Bitcoin, but it could. So when we talk about what a free market and money might look like, really all we have to start with is, is getting rid of these laws, these legal tender laws, and, and perhaps pass a law that's, that legalizes com competing currencies. And this is, this is happening. Bitcoin is an example of how this is happening technologically, whether with, that, with or without legislation. You know, just don't put people in jail for using something other than those green dollars for doing business. Now, certain states have even attempted to enact this legislatively. There was a movement in, in the state of Virginia, a movement in the state of Utah to say, hey, we're worried about what the Fed's doing. We're worried about what might be happening in the dollar. So we want to make sure our citizens can use other things like gold and silver, perhaps, as, as currency. And Friedrich von Hayek, who's, who's a very famous Austrian economist, you know, he argued that state monopolies and money are just as bad as state monopolies and anything else. And the competition works better. Now, we ought to let private issuers of currency compete to maintain the, the quality and the value and the reputation of the money they issue, just like Honda competes to maintain their quality and reputation. 
And like I said, all this can occur without even eliminating the U.S. dollar or the Fed. If you just, if you just pass laws or, or, or repeal laws that prohibit people from issuing private currency, then the U.S. dollar can, can duke it out. It can compete. And we can test whether this endless monetary expansion that allows the federal government to run deficits to pay for entitlements, et cetera, whether this, this really can go on forever or whether people might choose a, another way to, to protect themselves and, and to make payments for goods and services. So, you know, we can talk about free market and money, but, you know, we ought to go back a little bit to some of the principles that Mark talked about, the origins of money and the value of money. Really, the, the father of the Austrian school, a man named Karl Menger, way back in 1892 said, well, money is just the most saleable commodity. In other words, it's whatever commodity in society exists with the biggest saleableness, i.e., the, it's the most universally accepted. And it arises naturally to make society richer than the barter scenario that Mark outlined. It makes us richer because I don't have to have something you want to trade. So then, not too much later, the man for whom this building is named, Ludwig von Mises, another Austrian in 1912, he explains how money gets its value, not by government edict, but by having pre-existing value as a commodity in and of itself, on its own right. So real money, at least in the opinion of Austrian economists, has value independent of its use of money, like gold and silver. You can make jewelry out of them. You can they have industrial uses, etc. So historically, gold and silver have been the commodities with the most non-monetary uses. And they're in the greatest degree of saleableness, if we want to use that as a word, or moneyness. And they hold their value as commodities, independently of, of their value as, as money. They're durable. You know, gold and silver can, can survive being submerged in water or a fire. They're portable. They're small. You can carry them in your car or on your person. They're divisible. You can melt down coin into, into whatever denomination you want. And so to use gold and silver as money and to begin to, to move toward more of a free market in money by eliminating legal tender laws, for example, we wouldn't have to impose a gold or silver standard on anybody, right? You've heard this term probably, a gold standard. But really all that means, gold standard means that you can exchange money for gold. It's redeemable in gold. And having money backed by gold or silver or anything else, um, just as Mises explained, just helps to make the purchasing power of money more independent from the state. In other words, the state can't just produce a bunch of gold tomorrow like it can through the Fed and the Treasury produce a bunch of physical or electronic dollars tomorrow. So thinking about some of these principles and thinking about gold and silver and their place in history and, you know, what would a free market in money today look like? Well, just as we say, we wouldn't have to impose a gold standard on anyone legislatively. We didn't have to impose anything on anyone legislatively. In other words, what would a free market in money look like? We don't know. And we don't have to know. That's the beauty of the market. You and I don't have to know any more than we have to know what the future of automobiles looks like. Leave that to Honda. Leave that to smart engineers. Leave that to marketing people and salespeople. But what we do know is that the market wants money that holds its value. And the market wants money that's not subject to political and central bank manipulation. We know that. Now, undoubtedly, I think that a free market money would blend some of the old wisdom of gold and silver with some of the new technology, perhaps some of the blockchain technology that Mark alluded to. But history does show that gold and silver backing, meaning money that's redeemable in gold and silver, is almost certain to be preferred by the market. Uh, there's also the issue of universality. You know, it's nice to have a form of money that's accepted wherever you go. And gold... <coughs> Gold has been accepted throughout cultures, throughout time, throughout history. And it's still accepted today. Go to Dubai. Buy gold from a vending machine. I encourage you to do that, actually. And then I encourage you, if you can do that, I also encourage you to donate to the Mises Institute because you're, <laughs> if you're flying to Dubai and buying gold out of a, a vending machine in a big brick, then you, you probably don't drive a Honda Accord. So, you know, Mark talked about what money, to, new money might involve 
blockchain technology, and cryptocurrencies, you know, these do raise some anonymity questions. I mean, what you do online, even through encrypted technology, can still possibly be traceable. Um, there's also the possibility of electronic gold or silver. The, these concepts have existed where you have sort of a debit card, and it's backed and represented by actual gold in the account somewhere, but you just use the debit card, just like you use your debit card now at, at, at the grocery store. And, and the great thing about electronic technology today is that it, it solves this problem of divisibility, right? Let's say, let's say just a one-ounce gold coin is worth, what is it worth today? $1,100. Um, it's pretty hard to buy a loaf of bread. A loaf of bread does not yet cost $1,100. But with electronic technology, we, don't, we, we can divide things up. You, you know, electronically, you can just say, well, it's, it's one one-hundredth of an ounce of gold or whatever it is. It's very simple to do. Uh, so the, 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 con the problem of divisibility from 500 years ago when we actually had to use coins amongst each other, I, th I think it's easily solvable today. Uh, you know, we've heard and we've actually seen example of regional currencies that have arisen on their own, uh, like from local banks. There's currently a, a form of currency operating called Berkshires. It's in the Berkshire region of Massachusetts where a bunch of local banks got together. It, you know, money might look like something that's produced by a vendor or retailer that already has a lot of expertise in other areas. Rand Paul brought this up the other day. Perhaps Amazon or Walmart or somebody like that could issue money better than the federal government could. But as a, as a final note here on this, you know, it doesn't really matter how much money exists. Murray Rothbard talks about that in one of the readings that were recommended for today, what has government done to our money. See, prices will adjust. There's no need for a planned increase in the supply of money, which is basically the modus operandi of the Federal Reserve. More money doesn't mean that any more capital exists. It doesn't mean that we're more prosperous. If more money is created tomorrow, that doesn't in and of itself mean there's more food to eat or more Honda Accords to drive or anything else. So, you know, we talk about what money might look like, what banks might look like in a free market. I think they might look very different than banks do today. You know, Mark mentioned the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of Bitcoin. Imagine if you didn't even need a bank. Imagine if you had a, a, an electronic wallet that was safe enough and secure enough and you could conduct business peer-to-peer -peer with someone else using a money created by a third-party vendor. Maybe you wouldn't need banks anymore. Who knows? So there's a lot of things to be considered here, and it, it really could be quite a fascinating experiment, couldn't it? If we just allowed competing currency, if we allowed people other than the state to provide money, and the state could continue to provide the dollar. We don't need to create a scenario where there's panic or risk. You can still use dollars if you want to. So let me just say in closing, we won't solve the world's money problems today, and, and I don't expect you to take anything that any of us say today, matter of opinion, um, at face value. But if you're interested, I really encourage you to study more about money, the nature of money, to learn more about central banks. You could spend a lifetime studying central banks and monetary policy. So in conclusion, I'll just offer you two questions to consider before you go home today. First is that if what government says and a lot of central bankers say, and frankly a lot of politicians have said over the years, Dick Cheney, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, Paul Krugman, if what they say is true, namely that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department in tandem can create all the money needed to operate the economy and to operate the U.S. federal government, in other words, to make sure everyone gets paid and Social Security is paid, etc. If the government can just create this money, why do we need taxes at all? Why do we all have to pay taxes every April 15th? I'm sure some of you are going through this exercise in TurboTax. I'm mired in it myself tonight. In other words, if the government can just create money, why do we need taxes? Think about it. Second, if the government can just create money and improve the general prosperity, and that's something the Fed claims pretty openly, why isn't every country with a central bank doing the same thing and just creating prosperity across the board? Why didn't Zimbabwe become rich when it started printing money worth you know, in denominations in the hundreds of thousands or even the millions. In other words, why doesn't every central bank just create general widespread prosperity throughout the society? Well, the muddled answers to these two questions that we get, I, in my opinion, only demonstrate what everyone really knows, which is that money and prosperity are two very different things, and both are best left to free markets rather than to government. 
So with that, thank you for your attention. We'll take a short break.